Welcome to the Writing Western Podcast. I'm your host, Brennan Rensink. Today we talk with historian Flannery Burke about her award-winning book, A Land Apart, The Southwest and the Nation in the 20th Century. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Rudd Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. In each episode of this podcast, we host a conversation with an author or scholar of new work that explores the North American West. Disciplines will vary, the length of conversations will likely range dramatically, but we hope that each conversation will introduce you to new work, provoke as many questions as they provide answers, and inspire you to learn more about the North American West as a region, as well as its peoples, environments, histories, literature, and so forth. To learn more about the Red Center, our programming, funding opportunities for research and events, find us at redcenter.byu.edu. That's R-E-D-D center.byu.edu. Follow Writing Westward on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast or on Twitter at Writing West. You can find a list of podcast episodes and listen on the Red Center website and clicking on the Writing Westward Podcast tab at the top of the page. You can also listen and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and various other podcast networks and distributors. Thanks for listening. Flannery Burke is an associate professor of history at St. Louis University. She's an historian of the environment, the American West, gender and sexuality, and history education. Today we discuss her recent book, A Land Apart, The Southwest and the Nation in the 20th Century. It was published in 2017 by the University of Arizona Press in their Modern American West series. It won the Spur Award for Contemporary Nonfiction from the Western Writers of America and the 2017 Southwest Book of the Year Award. A Land Apart is a regional, century-long history of New Mexico and Arizona. It explores how the region's peoples and institutions evolved over the 20th century, interacted with the environment, with the nation, and with its own past. Burke approaches this large task from the premise that the nation has historically viewed the Southwest as a peculiar region, a land apart, and separate from the nation in terms geographic, environmental, ethnic, cultural, and in many other ways as well. She writes, the Southwest has been, to other Americans, temporally invisible, a place that somehow exists in another time. Bordering another nation, the Southwest has been spatially invisible as well, a place less American than its neighbors. The Southwest's problems have not always counted among the nation's problems. Because they do not know its problems, many Americans do not know the Southwest's stories, end quote. We'll know more. For too long, national perceptions of the regions had been scripted by outsiders who imposed ideas and identities upon the region. In telling the 20th century histories of New Mexico and Arizona, Burke instead privileges how the region's residents themselves have expressed identity and experienced their region. As an outsider myself, but one who has spent significant time in New Mexico and Arizona, I was thrilled by Burke's reorienting of my gaze and the invitation to understand the region on its own terms. I suspect you will be too. Professor Flannery Burke, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Um, I was trying to prep some kind of witty joke about how we'll be talking about the Southwest, and it's currently one of the rare months where places like Phoenix actually have enjoyable weather. Yes. Um, I, I couldn't think of a witty joke, but I happened to look up your current weather in St. Louis. And <laughs> am I reading this right, that today... You're in the mid-60s, but tomorrow a high in the mid-20s with snow? Yes, yes, and it has been like that all winter. <laughs> Just back and forth and back and forth? Yes. I, in some ways, I prefer it to typical St. Louis winter, which is 40 degrees and wintry mix and cloudy. So at least, especially on those really cold days, we'll get sunny weather which is uh, nice that's and that's kind of really cold and sunny is my favorite kind of weather oh. so we've had more of that which is lovely but um and and i suppose the 60 degrees are lovely it makes it a lot easier to walk the dog and stuff like that but the up and down is really hard to keep up with <laughs> though utah is similar right it's been like that yeah it, it's always like that it's always up and down so lately these last few days it's been um just kind of slushy and a wintry mix but could be worse um for our talk today, I wanted to kind of work our way through some of the main themes in your book, which you've divided out into four parts. And so maybe we'll kind of approach it by those parts and talk about why you chose those themes. And, you know, we'll see where we where we end up. But um, but before we get there, let's talk about you a little bit. So you um, grew up in the Southwest, correct? 
I did. Yes. I'm originally from Santa Fe, New Mexico. My mom's family is what some people call a primera familia, meaning that they can trace their ancestry back to original Spanish colonists. Uh, Not every member of my mom's uh, family, but if you go back and forth um, through her ancestry, you can do that. And my dad is originally from Kansas. Uh, We moved to New Mexico when I was, I think, about 18 months old, uh, maybe a little younger and uh, after he got out of military service, and I was there until I went to college. So was, your mom was kind of returning home then? She was. Her family did what a lot of New Mexican families did following World War II, which is that they moved to Southern California. Oh, okay. So she grew up in a very little town called Estancia, New Mexico, um, sometimes called Estancia. I, I've always said Estancia. Well, I'm yes. correct it now. <laughs> Um, so they moved from Estancia to Los Angeles um, to what I learned in the course of doing research for the book was a whole New Mexican diaspora community around Gardena and Inglewood in Los Angeles. And my grandfather taught high school chemistry there. Uh, later, the family moved to Orange County. And then after my mom had gone to college, and I think maybe even after she had gotten married um, and was with my dad in the service, uh, my grandparents and um, my mom's younger brothers and sisters moved back to New Mexico. Mm-hmm. So growing up in New Mexico, I mean, so you, you said you were there till you went off to college, right? Yeah. Did you have much of a sense of of regional identity or was it just home and just kind of where you lived? I think I began to develop a sense of regional identity pretty early I remember being very fascinated by stoops in Sesame Street when I watched it as a kid because <laughs> I didn't I didn't know what a stoop was. <laughs> what in the world is a city they live in, right? <laughs> right, right. And so it's I mean Santa Fe is not a big city, but we went to Albuquerque sometimes. I mean I I had I had seen other cities, but they did they didn't look like Sesame Street. They didn't look like New York City. They didn't look like Boston. So I think early on, I had a sense that other places didn't look like my place. There's a huge inculcation of regional pride in northern New Mexico, particularly in Santa Fe, some of which I think is absolutely marvelous. I I think everyone I grew up with is quite conscientious about water conservation, and I think that stems in part from regional pride. And some of which, um, as I discuss in the book, can be... Um, particularly with regards to race relations, quite harmful. Yeah. So I was I was getting those lessons early on. Uh, we were let out of school early. I think we maybe even had uh, the Friday of Santa Fe's Fiesta celebration off sometimes from public school. Uh, so th- th- so early on, I was exposed to this place is different, and that difference is something to be proud of. So when you left for college, um, how did your view of of your Southwest home you know start to evolve? It had already started to grow while I was still in New Mexico. I attended the United World College in New Mexico, which is one of now 17 campuses all over the world. Each host uh, country has about 25 percent of the student population, and then 75 percent of the student population comes from outside that host country or host region. Uh So I had gone to school with people from 75 different countries from the time that I was 17 until I was 19. And that was my first introduction in in a way to the south to some of the Southwest's extraordinary poverty. Mm. So that was the first time I saw my home through the eyes of people from really far away. And I, I places that I didn't think were that poor, they thought were just devastatingly poor. So you you and, didn't necessarily grow up in a in this in a bubble with no kind of critical thinking about about place. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, it, That's it, was, it was really, I mean, it was really crucial to my family and really crucial to the school that I went to before I went to United World College it, it, to think about inequality. I just think in a way, New Mexico was so poor that I didn't know what poverty meant, um, <laughs> if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so you didn't have the sense of, of scale, maybe. or Right, right. Some of what I learned at United World College was an, an awakening to my own privilege. I, you know, I grew up middle class, but some of it also was a growing understanding that the region that I was from was really poor compared to some other regions of the country and some other regions of the world. So when you went to, you went to Bryn Mawr, correct? 
I did, yes. Um, so when you went there and people say, oh, where are you from? And you say Santa Fe, New Mexico. How did, so I mean, you were exposed to how people, outsiders viewed New Mexico when they came to New Mexico, like at that school. Right. But how does that change then when you're hearing people react to New Mexico and Santa Fe or the Southwest more broadly at Bryn Mawr or at other places outside of New Mexico? Right. Well, I always had my dad's family in Kansas as kind of a way to compare. And so I knew New Mexico was brown compared to other places. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew that it was arid. I knew that it wasn't humid. I did spend the first couple of weeks at Bryn Mawr, uh, which means high hill in Welsh. I spent the first couple of weeks looking for the high hill. I, I kept thinking, you know, <laughs> surely they built the college on a high hill. Of course, this mountain. And then I finally realized in Philadelphia, this this counts as a high hill. Yeah. <laughs> and this definitely would not count as a high hill in the West. So, so that was my first wake up that I wasn't in the West anymore. Uh, I think a second wake up is that in one of the ice breaking exercises that we did the first couple of weeks of school, we were supposed to be in a, in a mixed group and all of the, not all of, but a good portion of the students in my group were comparing what subway stop they used in New York City. <laughs> and I thought this, this is diversity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, they're not only all from back east, they're all from New York, apparently, or all have a connection to New York somehow or other. Like Long Island was as exotic as they got. Yeah, yeah I think And then so. there's you. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I was perceived as exotic, but I definitely felt an instant kinship for other Westerners. So people from Seattle, people from Colorado, people from California. Very early on, I decided those were my people. That's interesting, even though, I mean, as we're going to talk about, you know, you really place the Southwest as a very unique place, even within the West. But yet you kind of felt this kinship to other Western folk. I do this with my students all the time, a lot of whom are Westerners and we we chew on like, what does it mean to be a Westerner a lot? And it's always fascinating that even people from all, all different places in the West, they still often find some commonality, some common ground, you know? Yes, yes. And I actually think that it's a little bit of a flaw in the book. I spent a lot of uh -oh. time addressing <laughs> that relationship between the Southwest and the nation, uh, which is in the title of the book, but the Southwest and the West is sometimes a little more occluded than I would like in an ideal world. Hmm. Let's get into this. And so you, uh, for your book, chose to define the Southwest um, geographically as Arizona and New Mexico. Yes. Have you gotten any pushback from people? I mean, they may, are they picking up the book and expecting to find California and Texas, Nevada, parts of Utah? Um, what, what's yes. people's reaction to your, your definition? Yes. And it's one of, I think it's the, probably the aspect of the book that I've gotten the most pushback from. Of and, all things. Right. Like as how you I define try, a region is as controversial as you get, really? Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and Western historians love to chew on that question. And the, the broader question of where is the West is something we don't, that's a bone we don't want to let go of. And the, I think the same thing happens when one begins discussing subregions. Yeah. For me, that regional definition is not just geographic, it's also temporal. So I was not saying where the 20th century, I was not saying where the Southwest is, I was saying where the 20th century Southwest is. Hmm. And it certainly includes California sometimes and Texas sometimes, I would say El Paso always, um, parts of Utah, Nevada, Southern Colorado sometimes. But as I say in the introduction, and as Erna Ferguson said in Our Southwest in the 1940s, New Mexico and Arizona are Southwest. Nobody argues about that. And when you add the fact that they both got statehood in the same year in 1912, I think that makes a political and geographic and cultural frame that is coherent and doesn't get out of control. Hmm. So I certainly could have talked more about California, but I joke in my own classes when I'm teaching the West that California is the monster that eats the West. And uh, there's a way in which, especially for 20th century Western history, everything collapses into California and the sub-regional exceptions in the West that are outside California don't get as much attention. Yeah. So I didn't want that to happen. 
And I didn't want the Southwest just to be an icon or a symbol. So I could have talked about Southwest Airlines. I could have talked about South by Southwest in Austin, mm -hmm. but Texas didn't get statehood in 1912. What's going on culturally with the use of that iconography is interesting. And I could have talked a little bit more about the relationship between that iconography and the real place that was the Southwest, but I didn't want the whole book to be about that iconography. Yeah. I mean, that would have detoured things quite a bit. It's interesting yeah. that you you kind of describe actually kind of an inverse definition of how I've usually thought about it. Like, you know, saying, does the Southwest include Arizona or New Mexico or California? But you flipped it and said, are Arizona and New Mexico the Southwest? And yes, they are. But if you ask that then if California is California the Southwest, it's a, that's a more complicated answer. Like, well, parts of it are and parts of it aren't, right? And and the same thing would happen with Texas and maybe with other states. But Exactly. And then, you know, quite where do you draw the line and what makes the difference? Because it's not going to be a political history cut off in any of those places. It's not going to be a geographic cutoff completely because the state and national boundaries of those places make a difference in terms of how those resources are managed in those geographic sites. So I, I had to go with what was coherent and yeah. New Mexico and Arizona were coherent. Um, I think it's going to become obvious like all of the all the ways in which that that really carefully defined focus um, really strengthens this project. Are there any things that you, you think like, oh man, I wish that could have been in here more, but because of the scope that I've chosen, I'm not able to include it? Yes, and I keep a list of all of the sources that I should have cited and didn't. For the second edition, right? It, yeah, I, you know, which will probably never happen, but it makes me feel better to imagine that I could correct my errors. And so... <laughs> So I do that. I really wish uh, I, I, this this doesn't get us outside of Arizona and New Mexico, but uh, there, another criticism of the book is that it doesn't give enough time to southern New Mexico, and I think that's absolutely true. Oh, like Las Cruces and yeah. yes, and I I hmm. tried to pull as much out as I possibly could, but there was more about the Guadalupe Mountains that I could have put in there. Uh, there was more about industry that I could have put in there. I don't think I used Monica Perales's book on El Paso and the way in which El Paso acts as a metropole for the regional hinterland that is northern Mexico, uh, southwestern Texas, mm -hmm. and eastern New Mexico nearly as well as I could have. So there is a lot there. I wish I had spoken a lot more about the Pecos River. I don't say anything about gay and lesbian um, and other LGBTQ communities. And that was because of a shortcoming in the scholarship. But I think that's going to change really, really rapidly. And there is a little bit more there that I could have pulled on that I didn't. Hmm. Well, there's always, so, <laughs> it's always <laughs> there's always endless ways you could keep revising for eternity, right? On right. These projects. <laughs> I was not paralyzed, but moving very, very slowly for a very long time on the book, partly because I hadn't yet decided what the temporal or geographic boundaries were. And once I decided this is a book about the Native American and Mexican Southwest, it, everything took off. You know, it, it was like a dam broke. And, yeah. and I you could write what I wanted and... to write. So yeah. once I decided what the Southwest was, I could write the book. And that gave me permission to leave some things out that I would love to have discussed. And in that magical second edition, I will. <laughs> but it would be impossible to write everything. Yeah. I guess we should state that you, I mean, you, you write, um, you define it as um, a place where independent indigenous nations are plentiful and also a place defined by longstanding communities of Spanish and Mexican descent. So it's, it's as much a geographic definition as it is um, the peoples that dominate um, dominate the region, which I think is really, really useful. Um, right. One of the, I mean, the book is called A Land Apart, and this is one of the broad ideas that you're trying to deal with. For a lot of the country, um, the Southwest has been defined by by outsiders as a place, as a, as a peculiar place, a weird place that is um, both geographically and temporally um, out of place. Could you kind of unpack this, these stereotypes that have dominated the view of the region and and then we'll kind of maybe shift over to how you're trying to correct those a little bit. Yes, I think that between the 1880s and the 1930s, a very well-established, some people would call it an anti-modern 
cultural representation of the Southwest took form and took off and, and spread all over the world and even internationally. And that Southwest was separate from modern industrial society. It was in tune with natural rhythms. It repeated uh, the stereotypes that were created about the place, repeated stereotypes that adhere to almost all indigenous people, that they move with natural rhythms, that they are more in touch with nature, that they are immune to the problems that afflict modern society. And that all of th that, that immunity was beautiful. Um, so yeah, it wasn't, a, it real... wasn't a, a negative. Right. Projection. No, they did. It was a positive. And in some cases, it's presented in some cases, people presented it as an antidote. But in some cases, in, in most of them, I think. Um, so the people that I studied in my first book, people like Mary Austin, people like Mabel Dodge Lujan, they didn't want to bring that. I don't think that they wanted to bring that antidote to the rest of modern life. I think they wanted to immerse themselves in it. I'd, they wanted to to change themselves by being in that place. Hmm. And I think that is the, the dominant image of the Southwest that outsiders um, formed of the region. And in fact, the you know, my first book is about Mabel Dodge Lujan and the working title of the manuscript is not the book isn't called this, but the working title of the manuscript was Finding What They Came For. Hmm. So there was a way in which outsiders said, here's this antidote to modern life that we need. Where is a place that has it? They decided the Southwest was the place that had it. And then they immersed themselves in that. Yeah. But it's, I mean, I, I have to admit in my own personal life, I've driven, I'm not from the Southwest. I'm from the Northwest. But um, my early experiences in the Southwest, I think even being completely unaware of, of all of this, of the, of the history of this going on. I was captivated by the region for all of those exact same reasons, um, hmm. which. And what were you responding to? I mean, I mean, I, I had a job where I just drove all over the the four corners regions and all over the Southwest, and and um, I was just really enthralled by the. There seemed to be kind of um, a mystery to the place, and I mean, you know, all kinds of you know, rom not romantic, like Valentine's Day, which it is today, Valentine's Day romantic, yeah. but like all kind of these romantic, mysterious ideas of landscape and people. And I mean, I was completely uninformed about what was actually going on. But uh, then when I started to study the region and st study how people had projected those very things on the region and kind of built up this imposed regional identity, I realized like, wow, like I, I fell into some of that without even realizing. I mean, so I think there is something, there is something about the place. Um, and there's something about Southwestern landscapes that um, that draws people in and, you know, maybe drive some of these stereotypes then, then being built. Right. And I think as an environmental historian, I don't think you can underestimate the effects of aridity, not just and rising barometric pressure, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, not just on what kinds of manufacturing and industrial opportunities can be in a region, but also on what photography looks like in that place. Hmm. And and what paintings of that place wind up looking like, you know, so for artists trying to capture the place, they they capture that crispness and then via those projections of the Southwest, but also via a, a whole host of cultural ideas that are circulating at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, that crispness gets associated with a certain kind of modernist expression. Hmm, and that modernist expression, I think, is what people are immersing themselves in uh, when they come to the Southwest in the early 20th century. And all of that said, I feel that way when I go home, too. <laughs> You know, so so I study I study the same material and I don't am I you know, kind of simply enacting the cultural projections that I absorb <laughs> as a young person or is there genuinely something about the place? Yeah. I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to fall in love with these places because we take better care of them when we feel a sense of connection and a sense of belonging to them. Yeah, fall in love with it for whatever reason you want, I guess, if it if it makes you treat the region well, right? Yes. Well, let's move into some of the um, some of the four themes that you focus on uh, as you go through chapters. I think it's four themes, two chapters per. Th sorry, four parts with two chapters per part. Yes. Nice and well organized. Um, Thank actually, you. I think I think that may be the exact same as my book. So, well, we can high five on 
well done. on organizing books similarly. Um, <laughs> so your first part is about, um, you call it borders. And yes. and it's, it's comparative, which I'm all about comparative history really like, and you're trying to bounce off how have Arizonans versus New Mexicans understood their um, Spanish or Hispanic Mexican heritage and how yes. they how they dealt with that differently. So what, what and kind of with each of these parts, I want you to kind of maybe unpack a little bit for us, like of all the many themes you could have used to look at this region in the 20th century, like why why did this end up on your list? Why was this so compelling? So there was always a dialogue in the book between or among the scholarship that I was synthesizing, the content that I was describing, and the argument that I wanted to make. And the scholarship that I was synthesizing is very rich and plentiful in the relationship between Arizona and New Mexico or individual communities or urban areas in Arizona and New Mexico and Mexico. So unquestionably, there had to be something about the border, yeah. uh, the U.S.-Mexico border in the book. What was revealed to me in the course of writing that section, and I wanted throughout the book to be as fair as I possibly could. So I didn't want it to be uh, – I didn't I didn't want it to be imbalanced. I didn't want it to lean towards Arizona um, and not New Mexico in certain sections. I didn't want the 20 the late 20th century to be more heavily weighted than the early 20th century. But the scholarship, the content and my argument were not always balanced in that regard. So what wound up emerging as the argument for that first part is that the border between Arizona and New Mexico matters as much as the border between the United States and Mexico. Mm -hmm. So when we think about borders, we should think about them more expansively, um, as, as you do in your scholarship, because we might lose track of other borders that matter when we fixate on one particular border. Yeah. So what do you think that this border between the two states, um, what does your work reveal about the differences there that maybe others have glossed over before? I don't know if people have glossed over because in general, they've tended to treat Arizona and New Mexico as entirely separate places. So uh, particularly for the 20th century, um, following statehood, I mean, for a while, it was all New Mexico territory in the 19th century, but uh, for, for a portion of the 19th century, uh, in general, people kind of treat the border as if the land drops off. <laughs> hmm. And so one of the trends that I wanted to trace were all of the similarities between New Mexico and Arizona, even though they're generally presented as a study in contrast. So Arizona is generally presented as forward looking, New Mexico as uh, embodying this ancient past uh, for the region. Arizona is generally presented as a place where corporations dominate the economy so extensively that workers have almost no agency whatsoever. Industry is almost invisible um, in in many histories of New Mexico. Yeah, especially when I think about all the kind of 20th century Sunbelt development histories I've read. It's a Phoenix story. Right, right, which is understandable because Phoenix grew spectacularly. Yeah. I mean, it's it's almost hard to get your head around how fast and how big Phoenix got. But that doesn't mean that New Mexico doesn't have some similarities. Yeah. So Albuquerque was also growing. Um, there were extreme and unf extremely unfair labor conditions in New Mexico, too. Um, there were people speaking Spanish in Arizona. In fact, sometimes more people speaking a more up to date in terms of international Spanish um, in Arizona than there were in New Mexico. So I, I wanted to trace the similarities across the state border. I also wanted to trace some of the differences. My um, my wife is from from Phoenix. And uh -huh. she, when she was a child, she had a very bad um, like cross country driving experience where like the moment they crossed into the New Mexico, New Mexico, like their car broke down and they were stuck in Gallup for three days or something like that. <laughs> and so she always says, oh, New Mexico. Um, that's how, that's like, how I talk about Texas. <laughs> <laughs> um, but maybe I'll have her read this section so she can maybe she needs to think more critically about maybe how she has more in common with New Mexico than she thought. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. <laughs> And Although I might I don't have know. more in common with Texas than I like to admit. Than you like to admit. That's funny. So in the second part, you talk about uh, you talk about Indian country. And yes. this, I think, I mean, I do a lot of native you know, studies. This really 
I really gravitated towards this. Um, and and, and I th in very interesting ways, um, I mean, we can make maybe some broad statements about how many Americans view indigenous peoples, right, as um, peoples who existed in the past, right? Native uh, existence today is often not talked about. They're, you know, a, a people of the past. Um, and you bring out, the, and kind of, I think, and make a compelling case that nowhere is this more apparent than than in Southwest Indian country, that of all the native peoples on the continent, this region has been really not perceived, but projected upon as being, you know, a place of ancient peoples, prototypical ancient native peoples, right? right. And somehow just even more out of step with the modern world than Americans usually, um, you know, present other native peoples as well. Um, and I never really thought about Southwest native peoples in that way, but the more I thought about it, I, I mean, I think you're right. I think that is how, I think that is the projection quite often. Did you realize that growing up or you know, after you left or as you researched the book, it, kind of in terms of how it's different, how the United States talks about the Southwest and its native people is different than in other, other places in the country? Right. I would say I didn't realize that until graduate school, partly because the native presence is so strong in New Mexico. So it's impossible to ignore the fact that native people are modern and and beside you in the mm -hmm. modern world so isn't that I the had... irony then right yes no it's extraordinarily ironic because, you could go other places it... in the united states and not run into very many native peoples and grow up there and think well i guess natives just can't aren't aren't really a thing anymore um you can't do that in new mexico or arizona oh, or a lot oh, of places in the arizona. Wells. i mean right. you just you just can't do it in the region but yet those are the natives that are often being tagged as being even more dislocated from the modern world I, I, in a very strange way, even though they're the ones who are most present in the modern world if you walk around town. Right. Yeah, I, I think the challenge for me in realizing that was how much of that false image is a product of how the region broadly is perceived. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, and I say this in the introduction, I think it goes back a bit to Charles Lummis's tramp through the region and his wedding of what he called the Spanish past and the native past of the region together. And he was one of the people who was presenting the Southwest as an antidote. And it was the place that was an antidote to modernity. And native people were simply representatives of that place. Hmm. Part, so part of the landscape. Get, Right. Um, so they get written, you know, they, they are and literally sometimes in advertising local color. So it, it's that association that takes them out of the modern world. And what I wanted to write about in the book was how they wrestle with that association, but also how utterly irrelevant it is to their lives. Hmm. Explain that. What do you mean? Well, so they, I mean, they have to deal with outsiders' impressions of them, but they are, you know, going about and living their lives. And so, especially once Pueblo land is settled, um, I shouldn't say settled uh, because <laughs> it's a constant battle, <laughs> um, but once once the turn of the century legal flip-flopping, which happens pretty quickly regarding the status of Pueblo lands, settles down uh, through most of the 1930s and 1940s and in, into the 1960s. Once that happens, Native people can marshal their territory, I think, in defense of their political and economic and cultural needs. Mm -hmm. And so culturally, they're always dealing with this false impression of the world. But in other respects, they are asserting their sovereignty, expanding their territory, getting the religious practice rights uh, that they uh, need and want. And they are doing that independent of this uh, mythology about them that they are trapped in a permanent past. Yeah. So what are some of the more revealing engagements or engagement that Native peoples had with the modern world that you think may surprise readers? I, I think a, a futurism maybe is is one of them. I oh I, I hope this isn't too roundabout for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so I was saying you know kind of a native people. I, I am not native, but native people were beside me all the time growing up, and my um, 
my mom's cousin is married to a woman who is Navajo in Picaris Pueblo. And I had second cousins, one of whom was the same age I was. And um, some of my second cousins have become artists themselves. And um, some of the art that one of my cousins, David Gasson, makes appears in the book. His brother, Wayne, recently made a piece called Adobo Bot, um, which is this massive robot made of Adobe. Hmm this massive robot sculpture made of adobe. And I think there's a lot of native interest in futurism right now. And when I went back to Leslie Marmon Silko's book, Ceremony, I realized that in some ways, uh, the way she is engaging with the post-World War II landscape of the Southwest, and particularly its nuclear landscape, uh, is a, in a, a kind of futurism. And so I think one of the ways that Native people are navigating the modern world, particularly in the post-war period, is via futurism and via new understandings and really deep and painful reckonings with the nuclear Southwest. Yeah, reckonings that are going to continue. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, in, in a, in a, for, a human, for human conceptions of time forever. Yeah, we're talking long half-lives, right? Right. I, we were going to get to this like towards the end, but you know, just recently we had um, a native woman elected to Congress from New Mexico. Yes. Think, uh, how how is that going to impact kind of you know like native peoples in the Southwest interacting with modern America or, or asserting that you know that they are part of modern America? Well, the political history is a really long one, so I, it, it, yeah, it's incredibly uh, significant and historic that Deb Holland is in Congress, but that doesn't mean that native people haven't been going to Congress for decades. Yeah. Uh, so the Pueblo delegation to Congress in the early 1920s in or um, that was sent in order to shore up um, the sovereignty of Pueblo land holdings that that was 100 years ago. Uh, the uh, delegation that was um, sent to um, shore up support um, for Taos Pueblo's um, claim of Blue Lake, which they require for religious practice. Uh, that happened in the 1970s. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of a good Arizona example. Can you think of a good Arizona example? <laughs> oh, man. No. Maybe Tohono O'odham yeah. status. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is... And the and the cross um the cross the cross national border uh, reservation. Yeah. So uh, there's there's been a lot of reckoning with the federal government. Um, that's not I don't want to lessen Holland's accomplishment at all because it's so so exciting. Um, honestly, not just you know not just for Laguna Pueblo, not just for Pueblo people, not just for Native American people, um, but I think for Southwesterners. I mean, it's just it's a very exciting representative um, for the region. Yeah. But that doesn't mean but she. It, she is no stranger to national politics and local politics, and neither um, are indigenous people broadly in the Southwest. Well, I mean, that's kind of what's interesting is um, there's been plenty of Southwestern Native engagement with the federal government and the on the national level. But it's interesting that, you know, this election has that now like the broad public media has kind of taken note of this moment. So it'll be interesting to see how she capitalizes on that and you know, how, how the how it impacts the region, you know, moving forward. And I shall be working with a group of southwestern politicians who have been navigating those chains of power for a very long time. Um, let's move on to part three, um, reducing the possession. This is maybe the most conceptual of the parts of your book. So here you're you're talking about how people are claiming ownership of of the land, of landscape both in figurative terms and literal terms, right? Right. Um, and how they are making place through tourism, through all kinds of ways. What, what brought you to this theme? And can you kind of unpack what, what these two chapters deal with? In a way, I think that's the section that I would most like to revise. But there are also parts of that section that I acutely love. And so I, I don't know if it's the best and the worst of the book, it definitely comes from my very deep interest theoretically in what do places mean, what does belonging mean, but those are pretty abstract ideas, and I'm not sure they're always as concrete in that section as I would like them to be. Something that would have made them more concrete would have been a very schematic, this is what public land is, <laughs> mm -hmm. and these are the various pieces of public land. <laughs> 
<laughs> that are present in the Southwest. And here's how these different pieces of public land came to be. And here's how they're managed. And here's how the borders of that management matter. Um, and I often wish I had done that section that way. If I had done that, I don't know if it would have the same evocative effect that I think the section has. So I go round and round and round about it. I wanted to explore various ideas of belonging. And by that, I mean, in what ways does the Southwest belong to the nation? In what ways do individuals own land in the Southwest? In what ways do communities possess land in the Southwest? And what does it mean when you say that you have a sense of belonging in a place? So abstractly, those were the four themes that I wanted to explore in that section. The fourth chapter is called Own It, and I wanted to invoke uh, not just these various ideas of property and possession, but also the more contemporary colloquial meaning of own it by how do we take responsibility for this? Um, if the United States has said the Southwest is ours, what does that mean? If individual communities in the Southwest have said this land is ours and it's not, it doesn't belong to other people, what does it mean to own that? Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean to own the fact that people have been dispossessed of their land in the Southwest? Yeah. So those were the big ideas that I wanted to explore in that section. It's possible that a more schematic description of public lands would have allowed a more material analysis, but I don't know what would have been lost in terms of the evocative, transcendent sense of the Southwest that you and I were describing at the beginning of this conversation. Lots of people want to lay claim to to belonging, lay claim to maybe like literal property ownership or kind of, you know, cultural ownership of a place, but o only within the bounds of the types of ownership or ideas that they want to to deal with, right? Or that perhaps right. that they want to sell, that they want to uh, promote. So it's a very selective sense of ownership and jettisoned along the way is, you know, all of the more troubling aspects of if you really belong to this place, then you need to reckon with X, Y, and Z. Right. We don't have a lot of models that thread that needle, but the introduction to that section is about the family of Aldo Leopold. Yeah, and yeah. Leopold was married to a Hispanic woman, which I don't think is commonly discussed. Um, not something that I thought of when I was you know, studying environmental history in graduate school, but the Hispanic and Mexican relationship to the land, I think undoubtedly influenced Leopold. And I originally wrote the beginning of that section as this very abstract, like meandering, what does it mean to write stories about places and how do we claim belonging by writing stories about places? <laughs> And the penultimate draft of the book had that awful introduction to that part in it. <laughs> um, and it, the reader's reports came back and they said, we don't know what she's trying to do <laughs> in this section. And in the meantime, I, you know, I had kind of hit myself in the head and said, why didn't I talk about Alda Leopold? <laughs> uh -huh. You know, what better connection is there between the ideas of, among the ideas of uh, belonging ownership and public lands than than Aldo Leopold and his family. Yeah. So I'm I'm so glad that I was able to to repair that section. And I do think the idea of a land ethic is perhaps how we thread that needle of possession and belonging. Hmm. Well, I mean this transitions well to the last part, which is kind of the two biggest troubling aspects of, of you know reckoning with with the region and ownership and you end out with kind of the, these two big environmental challenges of the southwest as a nuclear landscape atomic testing right. and uh and uranium mining and all and then the southwest is a region that's defined by aridity by water or by, by the lack of water i guess right which you know i suspect that if you went to many Americans and said, all right, give me a list of, you know, when you think of the Southwest, what are the top 20 things that you think of? Those might be on the list, right? Yes. Atomic yeah, testing and Los Alamos or uh, the desert, right? Uh, right, right. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that's pretty straightforward, that it's a desert. And that's where I think the boundaries of New Mexico and Arizona don't entirely work. On the other hand, in the same way that there's a way the history of the West can collapse into California, there's a way in which discussions of aridity can collapse into the Colorado River. Yeah. 
And I didn't entirely get out of that in the section on water in the book, but I didn't want it to be all about the Colorado River. But it it does dominate. Right. (laughs) It's a pretty important (laughs) watershed. So... It's, and it's very, very important to understanding the history of water um, in the in in the 20th century West, not just the 20th century Southwest. So much of what your book is doing is well, let's let's define and talk about the Southwest as the people who actually live there, think about it, and grapple with it, and and self-identify, yeah. right? Kind of like shifting from the outside projection of regional identity to the opposite, right? Um, right. How do you think that Southwesterners need to to grapple with these two ideas um, in in ways that maybe they haven't in the past? Well, I have the normal reluctance of any historian to tell people what to do in the present and the future. I want what's in the book to be relevant to contemporary Southwesterners and contemporary policymakers. I don't want it to dictate Mm -hmm. I found the biggest challenge of the entire book was writing a story that effectively ends in the present. And that was just a a very, very difficult aspect of the book to manage. I had never realized what a comfort it is to end your story, say, in 1935. Mm, Yeah. So, you know, ending my story in 2000 was effectively ending my story yesterday, as far as a historian's mind goes. So I'm reluctant to say that. That said, I find the advice um, from the artist at the end of the nuclear chapter who says things don't just have to get worse and worse. Uh, Just because nuclear technology is scary does not mean that's the only thing nuclear technology can mean. Hmm. And the only thing that we can do with our history of nuclear technology and nuclear waste and nuclear weapons and nuclear power production. And that, to me, really resonated with the historian's um, refusal to accept declensionist narratives. So that piece of advice I I would give to others, I would share. Uh, I'd share it particularly because it comes from my sources. It's not coming from me. Uh, So that's that's something that I think my scholarship reveals and uncovers, I suppose, is that there are lots of Southwesterners who have been thinking about this for a very long time. And they recognize that time doesn't move in just one direction. Hmm. That's interesting. I mean, because it is such a declensionist narrative in both of these topics, right? The, right. the, the nuclear uh, West and the, the arid West um, and everything right. those those entail. It's often, I mean, it's, it's rarely a rosy picture by the end of the whatever book you're reading on the topic. It is. And I don't know if I navigated it as well in the water chapter as I did in the nuclear chapter. But what I wanted to do in the water chapter was say aridity is abiding in the Southwest. It's not some new 20th century thing. (laughs) It's always been arid. Arid, Aridity is always something people have had to navigate there. And because it's always something that they've had to navigate, there's a lot of knowledge there about how to navigate aridity. And it's the looking away from that knowledge that causes us trouble. Well, you're maybe not telling what people to do in the present, but that's definitely kind of pointing them to things they need to think about, uh, right, histories right. they need to, to consider, you know, as, as they do look forward. It's almost 2020, right? I mean, so your book is, is the Southwest in the 20th. When Arizona Press comes to you for the second edition, they say, we need a, a good, strong epilogue um, <laughs> that, that, that brings in these last two, you know, these, these most recent two decades. Um, mm-hmm. What what would you have to say? Is there anything... Is, is it a continuation? Is it just, nope, these things are all continuing? Is there something that you see unique happening in the region now, kind of in the time period after your book closes? I don't know if it's unique to the 21st century, but I am extraordinarily impressed with the work that Gary Nabon is doing in southern Arizona on seed saving and food production that acknowledges um, longstanding cultural practices of both indigenous, of of indigenous, Mexican, Mexican Mexican-American, and Anglo populations. And how do we produce food in the future in a place conscious way? And I don't, that's not just a 21st century phenomenon. Gary Nabon's been doing his work for a long time, but I would want to say more about that, more about farmers markets, more about what some of the I don't know, kind of new incarnations of intentional communities in the Southwest are doing specifically vis-a-vis water production. Mm-hmm. 
So you see good things happening. I do see good things happening. I also, I, I, I hope I'm not too utopian about this in the book, and I'm, I'm aware of the scholarly criticisms of this idea, but I don't think the nation has really enjoyed what mestizaje can do to our conversations about race nationally. And I think something like Deb Holland being in Congress, um, something like the, the, the greater participation of um, Latinx uh, politicians, the greater participation of Linux business people, uh, the greater um, prevalence of Spanish in everyday language, that's coming from a lot of different sources, not just the Southwest. But the Southwest is going to be a has already been a big player in the 21st century. And I think that's going to be recognized in later histories um, of these decades. One of the ways you close out the book, and um, I think I cited this in the introduction before we started our conversation, is you're, you're saying that the Southwest problems have not always counted among the nation's problems. But you can flip that and say, you know, the Southwest solutions or developments and, you know, progressions, you know, haven't always been among the nations. But do you foresee more interplay here, more more conversation and integration between the Southwest and the rest of the country? On on optimistic sunny days, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's I it's sixty five in St. Louis, so is it sixty five and sunny today? Yes. All right. Well, yes. it's a good day it's, then. <laughs> it's it's quite lovely today. So, but there are, there are other times when I'm you know, just so discouraged. Well, that's, uh, that's that everyone. It would, be, it would be harder for me to articulate that. Uh, that's one reason in the book, I, you know, I end with the riot um, at the Santa Fe prison. I really wanted to make it clear that in some of the darkest moments, it can be hard to find a path through. I argue in the conclusion that stories are a path through, but we don't know quite where those stories are going to lead. Yeah. So... I, I guess I just I don't want to come across as Pollyanna um, or naive. Uh, there's not necessarily a positive future, uh, but there are the tools for one. Yeah. Are you familiar with the um, the novel The Water Knife? No. Um, by oh Bachigalupi, I think is his. I don't know how to say his last name. It's this like post-apocalyptic Southwest um, uh -huh. where there's no water and the the cities are all fighting over water. And yes, over, there's a few of them. Over water. Oh, there's more than one, right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, I, I've had the misfortune. I, I listened to it as a book on tape as I was running an ultra marathon down in Arizona, like dehydrated. And I'm like, why did I pick this book to be listening to, right? While I'm running through this desert region. But it it paints a dismal future. So I'm glad that you're finding, we don't, maybe you don't need to be Pollyanna. I don't think anyone's going to accuse you of that, but I'm glad you're you're proposing something a little more hopeful, or at least that we have the option to to make for a more hopeful future. I just think culture is more powerful than historians give it credit for. Hmm. So I, I can be home less than 24 hours and I use less water than I do in St. Louis because it's built into the everyday life of that place hmm. to conserve water. Yeah. It's just a question of, of bringing that culture to the fore in the commercial and corporate environments that are necessary for it to really make a difference. Yeah. We'll see if some of the problems that the Southwest has grappled with for the last century become problems that, um, you know, more and more of the country have to grapple with. So it'll be interesting to see if the Southwest starts to play a larger and larger role in kind of guiding things. Um, not, I mean, we, we are getting quite futurist here, aren't we, man? Um, we are. <laughs> we are. And I know I've talked particularly about water, but I, what I am most I'm optimistic about in the book is about race relations. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the the ways in which the idea of mestizaje could break down uh, the color line between black and white and other parts of the nation. Time will tell. Yes. I I don't want to keep you for much longer. Um, do you want to give us a sneak peek into anything you're working on next? What we can expect from you? So right now I'm writing a book that I call Back East, which is about how Westerners perceive the Eastern United States. Oh, that's great. It's so much fun, and it really builds on the Southwest book because that was when I said, hey, what if we gave attention to the people who already lived here rather than how the rest of the country thinks about this place? So it's just been a delight. It's it's like going home every time I sit down to work. We have lots of books about you know outside perceptions of the West, right? Europeans traveling in the West or Easterners looking West. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of other yeah, ones that, that invert that 
that reverse this. So that'll be. This is the east of the imagination. Yeah. Which I know you're a Westerner. Your wife's a Westerner. I'm a Westerner. I mean, it, it kind of goes back to those Sesame Street stoops. Yeah. So will this be a book of Western history or is this a book of Eastern history? If it's about Westerners and what Westerners are thinking, then I think that makes it Western history. Okay. All right. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I look forward to it. That sounds great. Yeah. It's certainly fun to work on. Well, thanks for joining us uh, for, for the hour, Flan. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Take care. You too. Thank you for joining us on this podcast. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Rudd Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. I'm Brendan Rensink, and I serve here as the host, producer, and engineer, and pretty much everything else at the podcast. So if you have any praise or critique, I guess you can probably send it my way. I also serve here at the Red Center as the assistant director and as an assistant professor in the Department of History. So please contact me if you have any questions, not just about the podcast, but about the Red Center, our events, our funding, or anything else. Our theme music was provided by local Utah composer Micah Dahl Anderson. You can find him at micahdahlanderson.com. That's Micah, D-A-H-L, Anderson with an O, dot com. I'll go ahead and include a link in the episode description. If you live here in the Intermountain West, let me also mention our digital public history project, Intermountain Histories. You can visit it at intermountainhistories.org or download the free mobile app by searching for Intermountain Histories on your Apple or Android devices. With this website and free mobile app, you can explore and read carefully curated histories of the region, complete with archival photos, bibliographies, and more. Each is researched and written by students and professors at universities around the region. Otherwise, please subscribe to the podcast or follow us on Facebook or Twitter to receive notification when the next episode goes live. We have many more fascinating conversations on the horizon and hope that you'll join us.